All right. Hi, everybody. It's RCFB Talk 199. It is Tuesday night. This is when we like to talk to you about whatever it is you'd like to talk about in college football. So I'm going ahead and firing this up real quick. Just letting, going to just drop a quick comment on how you can join the conversation via the X app, the Twitter app. I see John wants to join the conversation. I'm going to go ahead and let you up, John. So, yeah, this is a chance where we get to talk to you about everything going on. Um, whatever you want to talk about in college football, uh, the past week or bigger stories. I know last week, to my surprise, EA football got talked about a lot. Um, we can talk about that more if you'd all like. I don't mind. I saw one of my uh, colleagues who tweets from this account. Apparently, Clemson got placed in the Mac in one image. So there you go. Obviously, um, I always like to think of July 1st as the kind of college athletic new year. The uh, season seems to transition from June to July. This is the season. This is the day. This is the month where typically all the major changes happen, all the calendar resets. So I know Oklahoma and Texas are now officially in the SEC. They had their big celebrations. They unearthed Pitbull at Texas to go play in Austin. And uh, Cal, Southern Methodist, and Stanford are now in the ACC. For whatever contractual reason, the Big Ten, I don't believe, officially gets its new members until August 1st. I, I'm not sure why. Who knows? I wasn't a part of that deal. Uh, and then, of course, the Pac-12 is now two, um, two members. You know, I, I just want to say, to the credit of the Pac-12, you know, we're now in media day season, the sort of the, the summertime, you know, events where everyone goes to the conference media days all across America, and you get the same generic quotes from mostly everybody but i mean i get it it's an opportunity just to kind of reset listen to what coaches think of the season get quotes that go all over twitter some of which might be interesting some not and to an extent that's gotcha journalism but sometimes some coaches are really interesting um a couple of coaches i can think of were extremely interesting interviews but you know um for various reasons you always understand why people would play for these guys when you talk to head coaches in that context but all of that said the pac-12 you know they used to have their uh, media days, at least in the past several years, in Las Vegas. Um, last year was obviously the last full one. But this year, they're still going to be in Vegas. So the Big 12 is moving into Vegas for this season, at the very least. They're having their media days at Allegiant. Um, Brett Yarmark loves to throw money around, and they're going to have their hotel as the Bellagio, which, to their credit, wow, that's a, that's a great choice. I think you know the Mountain West is at the Circa, which is a fine hotel in downtown Vegas, like right off the, the Fremont Street experience. But they're on the same week. So you got the Big 12, and then like the last day kind of half overlaps with the Mountain West firing up, and then the Mountain West goes for two days. And to kind of split the difference, because again, the Big Ten, probably the Big 12 is doing it in Vegas because they're adding all those former Pac-12 teams, you know, the border states, Vegas is a good spot for that. Um, the Pac-12, I love this. They're having, and this is how they're officially calling it. This isn't me just making this up. After Hours with the Beavs and Cougs presented by the Pac-12, it's going to be at a ballroom in the Bellagio Hotel. Um, cocktails will begin. I mean, this is for media members. I'm not saying like y'all don't go show up there. I'll, you know, but, uh, at the same time, I mean, this is, this is great. I love this. And, uh, that is that I, if the PAC 12 can do this with panache for the next couple of years, I think people are really going to appreciate that. So I just wanted to, to toss some of those things out there and also just kind of a quick 10 year anniversary to the Maryland and Rutgers move to the big 10 boy, did that end up turning out quite good and then i mean we can talk about whatever you'd like you know I, i've let a few folks up here i want to get to them so john how are you doing i let you up here first and we'll get to our our friend uh, uh rock talks rock probably rock chalk sports talk and of course ski mask smurphy john how are you doing tonight hey how you doing man i'm good i'm great i figured out everything technologically there shouldn't be a hang up this time seems like every week i just some other surprise happens ever since that video got added to these yeah, it feels like you're working on a car that something breaks on every week, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like an old Jag, you know? Yeah, well, hey, you know, there's a lot going on right now. It is, it is you know, July 1st was yesterday, so I feel, you know, it, it feels like moving day out of college. Like, everyone's going into different places. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it, it feels like Pac, the Pac-12 is the abandoned building that no one wants to be at the moment. Uh, you know, everyone just moves to the Big 12, the SEC. And you know, Clemson moved to the Mac. Congrats to Clemson, man! I'm I'm really proud. Yeah. They really they're really playing at their power level, playing you know, playing over the Mac. But um, I, I will say you're gonna get a lot of questions about uh, EA probably tonight. 
uh, college football. They uh, dropped their dynasty uh, preview today. It mm-hmm. is 170,000 words long. It's probably the most insane, detailed dynasty I've seen in any sports game. I'm not going to get into it. I'll let someone else jump in there. I <laughs> well, I hope it's good. I hope it's good. All I have to say is, I remember last week we were all talking about the toughest places to play rankings. I just said, look, they're going to make controversy to people talk about it. And then the defense rankings came out, and I'm like, if that doesn't hammer that point home, seeing USC, and, and hey, I'm an alumnus of USC, I will fully admit, you know, but that seeing USC in those rankings, seeing Colorado in the power rankings over a team like Tennessee that was not included, um, yeah, no, so th- that's all we need to know. We're just being, you're all being cajoled into talking about it, and it's working, and we're going to hope the game is as amazing yeah. as all of that yeah. is. I-, I did have a quick question, non-related to the game. Uh, sure. So now that we had all these moves are official, I guess except for the Big Ten, but whatever. They can do whatever they want on August first. But of all the official moves that have occurred, um, what do you which one do you think will have the most immediate impact coming into the season? Oh, I mean, I think the Big Ten's still going to have the biggest impact. Because I mean, Texas and Oklahoma in the SEC are incredible ads, but I mean it's gonna be a tough sled for everyone. Texas is probably of all the well, Texas and Oregon are certainly the two teams that are moving that have the best chance to to take this first season and run with it, um, particularly in the twelve team playoff where you don't even necessarily need to win your conference; you just need to finish in that. Especially with those two conferences, perhaps in the top uh, three or even four spots, depending on how well you did. Um, so I think those two teams are the most likely to run with it. But I think um, just because of the sheer caliber of teams that they brought in, I, I think the Big Ten may benefit more. But, you know, who knows? You know, I am old enough to remember when Miami joined the ACC and we're, everyone's like, oh, wow, well, it's going to be Florida State and Miami every year. And then Miami just kind of decided, you know what? Let's forget it. We're not really into this anymore. We're just going to go in a complete bender for like 20 years um i'm gonna tell you anyone who was around in 2001 did not see this coming did not like we were we we were like wow they're leaving those weak ass big east folks and they're going there and boy so that's why you know we'll see uh rock talks probably rock rock chalk sports talk how are you doing good man how are you great Good. Hey, so I kind of want to piggyback off of uh, John's question a little bit. So, I mean, weird times, obviously, that we're living in, in terms of all the moving and all the different, you know, conference realignment and everything. My question to you, because I have a couple schools in mind, who do you think is going to benefit the least in terms of like school wise? Mm -hmm. Which schools do you think are going to benefit the least from the conference realignment and all the teams that are moving in? So I'm talking like, SMU, you know, UCLA, Oregon, all these different people, Oklahoma, Texas, who do you think is going to have the hardest time shifting over? Okay. So that's, that's, it was funny because at first I'm like, well, if we're looking at all the teams, I'm going to say if you were a middle or lower caliber team in those conferences, life is going to suck. You know, if you're Indiana, like this is not a good time to be Indiana. (laughs) They just let it, but of the teams, I mean, everybody who's moving. Yeah. Yeah. The teams are actually moving. I'm curious to see how this goes in the long term for Oklahoma. I'm just curious. I, they should be fine. But Texas right now, I think, because they seem to have taken the momentum. Because, um, hey, I I was a doubter of Sark. I was a strong doubter of Sark. But, man, have I been proven wrong. I, I mean, in what he says and what he's doing, you know, he's proof that you can turn around your life if you kind of bottom out in a really awkward fashion, right? Um, so I'm less worried about Texas, but also let's see UCLA as well, only because they join part of the reason. So going back to two years ago when they announced that they're moving USC just wanted to move because they just, we're not getting enough money where everyone watches us when we do well, the, the conference does well, et cetera. And there's some, there's some, there's some legitimacy to that UCLA moved because first of all, they were happy to move and they wanted the, the money, right? They really desperately needed the money. And that's part of the problem that also Cal has. Cal arguably is even in the worst financial straits. That's a whole other kettle of fish we could get in that conversation. They had probably the worst financing policy they've ever, like an, an enormous amount of money of their budget every year is debt service. They probably have double the amount of debt of the next school in the country because of just a really, really stupid decision they made about, oh, 10 years ago. Um, right. All of that said, uh, I think, you know, UCLA and Cal would definitely be part of that because UCLA, they're trying to 
climb back up to financial like benefit. And they should. I mean, they're in LA. Their basketball team's popular. They're you know they're very good at non revenue sports. I mean, they even make some non revenue sports make money. I mean, that women's gymnastics there pulls in a crowd because they're really good at it, and people like that kind of exciting play. Um, but uh, yeah, I think those. If I'm trying to pick people from those three conferences right now, the Big Twelve is a little tougher. I'm not sure who I would pick in that group to be the one to have the toughest move because if of all the conferences, that one seems the most evenly lined up. I'm actually like, wow, these are these are actually teams that I'm kind of looking forward to seeing all play each other. While Cal and and geographic distances aside, I mean, I'm worried about Cal. I'm worried about. Uh, UCLA and and Oklahoma, I'm just more curious about. I, I'm not going to go and say I'm worried because it is Oklahoma, and they certainly can win. Right? Yeah, 100. And in terms of the Big 12, I mean, you look at like Arizona, Arizona State. Arizona has had their own financial troubles in the past as well as of pretty recently uh, in terms of their athletic department. Um, but I mean, the Big 12, I'm so excited for it. I mean, obviously, you know, KU guy, I run the KU uh, radio show over there, but in terms of who I think is going to struggle the most, and maybe this is the elitist in me, but I think it's going to be SMU. I think SMU is going to have a hard time bumping up, even though it's, I mean, it's still a bump up. I mean, Louisville dealt with that for a while too, when they, whenever they bumped up from the Big East to, you know, the ACC. So I'm interested to see how that's going to work out in terms of SMU jumping up. I know they have all that NIL, but still, it's it, like I said, maybe it's the elitist in me, but I still, I still think it's going to be SMU. Yeah, we'll see. Um, uh, they have a good quarterback this year, so it would be a longer run thing, only because yeah, they're not getting also the full financial payout, which could certainly impact that. And I, I agree. That long term, I'm more concerned for them. But in the short term, they seem to have the weapons to jump in and compete. But yeah, I think that's a very legit call. Um, Ski Master Murphy, what's going on? I'll try to get everyone in order here. Uh, so again, I, everyone, it's great to have you up here. And, uh, and it's always wonderful hearing from you. And feel free to stay up if you'd like um, after you've talked. But Ski Master, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Today, I guess this month is going to feel like the first day of kindergarten for all these new teams traveling everywhere. And my feeling is, what do you think was sort of like the biggest thing that impacted sort of like spurning this sort of trend of realignment? From from my own memory, it feels it feels like partially my alma mater, Michigan and the Big Ten are largely responsible for what happened, given how they um they pinched Rutgers and just bought out Maryland from the ACC. And then some other things they did in other sports that pissed a lot of people off. One I know, such as hockey, was forming out your conference there. I think the Big Ten sort of like started a trend of like, hey, we're going to do whatever it takes. I just want to know how you felt about that. I think certainly, I mean, it's hard not to, to argue money is part of this. I mean, Texas and Oklahoma just realized, hey, we can get a lot more money if we go to the SEC. And they sort of kicked that off. And then USC sitting there in the Pac-12 really wondering how on earth they let things get this bad. And instead of waiting with it, I think they just decided, you know what, we're going to move too. And then UCLA was like, can we come? And, you know, and they did. So um, I think to an extent, uh, extent that's going to be part of it. Now we'll see if the ACC breaks apart. That's a, that's a whole other question there, right? You know, um, uh, that's going to be the next step in all of it, but we'll see if they can they can keep it together for sure. You know, I see a couple of hands that have come up to probably participate in this particular point before we move on to another caller. Uh, Andrew, uh, we'll start with you, our co-host. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, my friend. How are you? Good. Uh, I guess I'll chime in a little bit to that point. Um, you know, I gr I agree with your point that. I think ultimately the the realignment of 2011, 2012, this was just kind of inevitable. Um, you know, conferences were still relatively geographically aligned and you still had um, the Big East in its form. Um, so yeah, this, I feel like this was inevitable to happen. I'm kind of surprised it took uh, 12 years or so uh, for pretty much the 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 major well I guess yeah yeah yeah, yeah. losing the Pac-12 I'd say was probably the biggest collapse 
Um, but even that was started by OU with Texas. Uh, it'll be inter- it'll be interesting to see, you know, you know, like you said, does I'm I'm basically repeating what everyone's saying. I just I guess wanted to hear my own voice. Um, Nate, your hands up. What's on your mind? Hey, yeah. So uh, later on, I have my own points to bring mm-hmm. up about some different topic. But on in regards to this topic, I think one of the things in the past. 15 you know 20 years have kind of set off this whole you know realignment thing um was the actually the longhorn network um yeah yeah, because i think that was one of the first opportunities where you know one of the schools us texas we saw an opportunity it's like this is a way that we can boost our revenue and boost our recruiting and our brand exposure um and you know, since then or whatever, I think Texas and Oklahoma have always had like big, you know, bigger shares in in the Big Twelve. And when that kind of started off, that's what really annoyed um, Texas A and M, and that's what kind of started that whole domino effect that you know had Texas A and M and Missouri leave for the uh, um, leave for the SEC, and then you had Colorado and Nebraska leave, which then resulted in us in the Big Twelve having to bring in um, you know West Virginia. West, and, West Virginia. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, for other than West Virginia, you know, at a time with like Nebraska and Colorado and a and and Missouri, it was still kind of geographic. But over time, schools started to realize it's like, what is the point of being geographic? Let's just move wherever we can and move wherever who is going to take us and make the most money. So um, I think the Longhorn Network was a big catalyst for a lot of the, you know, realignment 15 years later. And yesterday was the first day that it ended or whatever. So funny enough, you know, that's not a, I could definitely, I could see the argument because I remember the animosity that the big, the Longhorn network uh, created. I mean, it is going to exist again. It's going to be a streaming channel. So um, I always thought it was cute. The Christmas day with Bevo thing that they would do every year. I thought that was a cute idea. I'll give them that. Um, and, and all the different times you can watch the, uh, the 2005 Rose bowl, um, uh, 2006 for a national championship game, technically, but um, yeah, no, I, uh, uh, I know that it also was a hang up, gosh, for those who were around when the rumors were absolutely wild that uh, Texas, Oklahoma, um, Oklahoma State, and then the question was who else was going to join the Pac-12 at one point, um, turned into the Pac-16, which obviously didn't come together. Um, but that had been one of the sticking points, I recall, uh, when they were talking about that particular thing. Um, but yeah, no, I think that that that, that would be an interesting one to, to kind of think about as well. Let's see, there were a couple of other hands up. Unknown, uh, your hand was up, and then Rocky, and then we'll go back to John, and then I promise we'll also get a chance to go back to everyone and, and talk about the main point they wanted to also bring up. So, um, I had a couple of questions. One, um, with, like, with the ACC more than likely going to get picked apart, um, I mean, like, in regards to like the SEC possibly grabbing Florida State, Clemson, or like the um, UNC, NC State, or you know Virginia, Virginia Tech combos or whatever, you have obviously like you know the Big Twelve would be interested in some schools, and um, you know basically what I wanted to ask is like, well, given how I guess the idea is to move to a more power twos and like maybe mid like mid to I mean if the ACC is gone, it's just one of the one big major conference, right? Like. For some of like the more top tier G five conferences like the Sun Belt or Mountain West, I wanted to see uh, like like do you think they would make moves in the future to um, like maybe c- consolidate like you know I know like while you know like the you know, people are mentioning it that might be uh, something they can look forward in the t- future like you have you know like the Pac two schools might do reverse merger or just join the Mountain West outright. Um, both the Sun, the Sun Belt, American, I think the Conference USA or the, and the MAC um, media rights deal ends around 2031. I just wanted to, like, the first question is, like, do you see any real, like, movement, like, a po- possible movement towards making a, like, a G5 Super League, right? You know, that's that's occasionally come up. I'm not sure um, if such a thing would, would occur, but I... <sighs> Uh, the situation, I mean, there's a whole question, I mean, even among some G5 commissioners of whether they should just truly kind of divide and separate. I don't think they ever would do that. Um, 
But what happens if, let's say, the ACC comes apart and there's going to be teams left over? They will yeah. be. I'm not sure what will happen to Wake Forest. I'm not sure um, if Boston College has enough cachet anymore to necessarily find a home. Um, but at the same time, you know, like, yeah, what happens? You know, it's so funny. I was talking about that earlier instant with uh, the Pac-12 nearly getting Texas, Oklahoma, and a couple of other, those other schools. And the question was, you know, what happens to the handful of teams that were left? And I remember back when he used to write every day should be Saturday. I think Spencer Hall nicknamed it the Scrapple Conference, which was just kind of like Kansas, Iowa State, Kansas State. Like, not bad teams, but it was just like, where do they go? You know, like, when till they find a place? Um, obviously now all those teams are quite secure, but I, it would be an interesting thought. I know, uh, Andrew, you had a thought on this. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, uh, I would say the two, honestly, let's the power five conferences. So honestly, the only conference that would have any sort of incentive to merge would be conference USA because it's the, the land of misfit toys as it were. Um, but the Sun Belt's not going to merge cause they're doing great. The Mac's well, I mean, not going to, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. What I, what I meant is like, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to predict this because, you know, like when you have, I guess, Louisville and maybe Georgia Tech and Miami and whatnot, like you, like in the year the Big 12 or, you know, like, you know, the, the, obviously the bigger schools for the SEC and Big 10, you're not really going to think about adding Memphis or like USF when you have those options on the table. I wasn't talking about the mergers in like every conference merging. It would be like more like, let's say the Sun Belt, like basically snatching teams, let's say, you know, like come 2030 or whatever. Mm. Obviously with a better media deal, like, you know, like asking, inviting. Yeah, I don't know if the Sun Belt would necessarily raid the MAC, but all of that said, you know, we've seen it happen before. The Sun Belt got absolutely uh, robbed by Conference USA back in the day. And then later on, they were able to kind of come out on top. I still think that's one of the better uh, G5 stories is how the Sun Belt went from being the absolute bottom of uh, FBS football conferences to being like a solid G5, you know, conference only because they, when they needed to be, build themselves back up, they were quite smart about it and they were willing to make some cruel decisions because they had Idaho and New Mexico State as football only members. And then once they realized they were going to come up to uh, a full number for uh, the title game. They were like, all right, you guys are out. And then Idaho obviously moved back to FCS. And uh, New Mexico State made had some really awkward years as an independent before they, they joined Conference USA. Um, and then Conference USA now is in the awkward uh, the awkward position it's in. But right. it's an interesting question. It, it really is. It's, it's, it's theoretical, but it, it's a fascinating idea to see you know, could Conference USA or the problem is also distance. So I'm not sure, for example, yeah, I agree. The Mountain West would be a hard one to see. I'm not sure who they could really pull in. Although, you know, at one point, I remember the whack when it used to have Louisiana Tech and like Hawaii. So, uh, you know, anything's possible, right? Right. Um, I mean, and then the last question is like, with like, I mean, I don't know like what your thoughts on the potential, like on the movement and futures of like the bigger, like, you know, like how the FBS is going to like the subdivide or, you know, like move forward. But like when you have like, if we do have a situation to where like the G5 and, you know, the G5 is basically kind of like the FCS, you know, like in quotation here, like. What like do you think schools like you know like for instance like the Montana schools or the Dakota State schools? I know like Maine just recently dropped like a hundred million, like hundred and ten million dollars. That's like one of those things no one talks about. Like they just dropped like a massive amount of money on these facilities and um like um facility upgrades. But, like do you think like they just might just kind of swallow the pill and just jump up and so so they can so they at least have the veneer of being kind of because I like you know obviously outside of people who enjoy college football and whatnot like even today like, people think like some FCS schools are, like D2 or whatnot like do you think some schools or like, even some conferences might just swallow the pill and just like move up to whatever the G5 or whatever the I guess future like if I think is, we'll if, oh yeah I think we'll certainly see teams doing that I think we'll absolutely still see teams doing that I'm not sure though um because, I mean, we're going to get Del- – obviously, Kennesaw State joined officially now, so they're now a Conference USA member. And then we're going to get Delaware. Um, there's one other team I'm now forgetting. 
but we're getting Delaware that's coming up as well. So we're getting Missouri State. Missouri, Missouri State. State. Yeah, there's teams that are all making the jump up because even though, and for some of you may remember, last off season, I want to say they upped the the fee for uh, it was like in the it was like something comical, it was five like thousand bucks, million. and then it went to like a couple of million. And then I, I, to the credit of the the good journalists, actually went and interviewed you know obviously anonymously uh, both G five programs that had recently moved up but also some fcs programs and they said that money's not going to make a difference we're gonna, if we're going to jump we're going to jump that that ain't that ain't going to keep any of us out um if push comes to shove oh my goodness i want to get to also allow some of the folks who've been really patient wanted to just join the conversation they've been waiting in a queue um let's see here you know uh mac agenda pusher you've been super patient i want to allow you to come into this conversation what just whatever topic you don't have to join the one we just had um what's on your mind Hey. Uh, hey there. I was thinking about uh, Clemson in the match. Yes. And I, I just have the one thought, and that is that they wouldn't win it. They would not win that conference. Okay. I, 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 will, I, will, I will listen to this. Why? All right. Imagine the Clemson Tigers. It's 7 p.m. on a Wednesday. <laughs> They're in Rhinerson <laughs> Stadium in I November. I love this. They're on gray turf. They're playing in front of 8,000 people. <laughs> Is their heart in it? Are they going to push to win? Oh, when they, when they see when they see those players run through that that cement, do they remember when they tried and they actually made the cement block wall <laughs> too strong, and so the players were like sitting there pregame, like trying to smash that cinder block wall. That <laughs> yeah, this is the kind of conference the Mac is. You got players breaking concrete before the game. Oh my goodness, unplanned. They're just about the rubber bowl isn't being used league. anymore. I'm, I'm just imagining the yeah, playing that's a, real shame. That's a perfect Akron. venue for that. <laughs> <laughs> my second point towards this is that 2023 Clemson could not beat Miami of Florida. Imagine if they had to play a Miami that can win a conference. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> oh then? my goodness. This is, you're just coming in guns blazing. I love it. This is why we love Mac fans, by the way, folks, this, 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 yeah, this is what makes Mac the best. I'm just, I'm saying that right now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, those are my two strongest points. Clemson would well, not. Well, I have win one last question for you, though. Who do you think has the best shot of getting that that in, inaugural uh, G five spot? I mean, Toledo and Miami of Florida are the two I'm thinking. Apart Miami of Florida, <laughs> boy, <laughs> Miami of Ohio are the ones I'm thinking of. They've got a snowball's chance. Yeah, in hell. but what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think at the moment. Toledo and Miami are the two strongest programs in the MAC. It's no coincidence that those are the two that played for the conference championship last season. And I, everything I'm seeing is that they're the two uh, predicted to go back to Detroit this mm -hmm. season. So, coin flip, one of those two. Toledo was sneaking their way into a couple of the top 25 rankings uh, towards the end of the season. There didn't finish in the top 25, if I remember correctly, but they were. Creeping up there. If they have a good enough season, I think it's not out of the question that Toledo could be the first G5 12 team playoff. I agree with you. And Candle is still one of the most underrated coaches who I'm just shocked has uh, has not been poached. But I mean, great for great for the Rockets. That's all I got to say. That, that's incredible. Um, to you yeah, well. Man. Hey, thanks for joining us. That was great. Um, let me see here. Uh, thanks for absolutely. Me. Anytime. Anytime. Rocky, what's going on, man? Hey man, it has been a hot minute since I've been on. <laughs> back. Uh, yeah, uh, I was gonna say one thing that uh, the guy was talking about earlier, where he was talking about the Longhorn Network, and it's funny he brought that up because he's right, but probably not for the reason he knows. Because the reason why the Longhorn Network was so controversial was because at the time the Big Twelve, uh, basically the payout scheme, was based in part off of how many times your your team was on television. So Texas basically figured out, hey, if we have our own network, we're televised for every single game. <laughs> and so, like, it, that, and every time that it got brought up, the other teams wanted to rework it. Texas just threatened, well, we'll just quit the conference if you don't let us have this. Yeah. And so, of course, Nebraska, Missouri, and all of them were like, all right, well, screw this, we're out. Um, but I always thought that's a little tidbit most people don't realize is that the Longhorn Network originally was created because it was basically a loophole in the way the bylaws of the Big 12 were written. So they would collect way more income than anybody else. 
Um, as as someone who's a background as a lawyer, I love these sorts of stories. It's sort of like when yeah. when, when Brett Bielema figured out that you know the one time they, they had to amend a rule change because he figured out that you could kill the end of a game by committing penalties or, or something like that. And Joe Pa was on yeah. the other sideline, like, dude, what the hell, man? And yeah. he's like, oh, they ain't against, they ain't against the rules. So but, yeah, that one that was funny. I I, I had two topics. I'll get through them real quick. The second yeah, please, one, real please, quick. Please do. Yeah, second one, I want to talk about the absolute disrespect that EA has shown West Virginia in all of their ads. I I will I will pay money if somebody can find one video where West Virginia has a flag, stadium, logo, anything. We're not even ranked in the top 25 for any of their metrics even <laughs> though our some of the guys who have done analysis is some of the teams above West Virginia literally <laughs> They went position by position, and they're like, we are better than this team in every single position, but we're not even on this ranking. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I just got to say, and I, I said it last week when they're talking about the toughest place to play, but when they started releasing more of these rankings, if it wasn't clear that they were doing these just to get people's attention, like, I don't even, when Colorado and USC appeared in the list of top defenses, I mean. <laughs> That's just riding like, the prime train, man. That's yeah, that's, I mean, hey, it got people train. interested. I, and I mean, I yeah. get the prime thing because only because, and I've said this before, the, the the draw he has is unreal. I mean, I can step back and just say objectively, I remember I was covering the game because um, I like to cover some of the, the, the unique games that hit the Twin. I live in the Twin Cities up in Minnesota, but I remember, so South Dakota State hosted a game in the Twin Stadium. I'm like, yeah, it's fun. It's I, I've been there for a North Dakota State game several years ago, which actually Trey Lance's first game. But um, I remember I'm like, oh, that'll be fun. So I'm talking to just one of the staffers at the Twin Stadium. And then I said, like, yeah, college football is fun. You know, it's FCS, but this is a great team, South Dakota State. And she's like, yeah, I love Dion. And I'm like, okay. You know, and I just remember I'm like, all right. And then here's, here's what even gets better. Like a month ago, um, I was in Toronto, just my kids. I took them there, you know, at the end of the year. Uh, and again, I'm in the Uber, like, and the guy's just talking like sports and and I'm like, yeah, you know, go Raptors or whatever, you know. And then he's like, oh, do you, are you in the sports? I'm like, yeah, I cover college football sometimes. And I mean, I'm in Canada. I don't expect this guy who is, I think he was from uh, the West Indies somewhere. And he's like, oh, man, Deion Sanders. I'm like, oh, damn, yeah. really? Like, you know, and I, I, I mean I, that in a, in a sense of almost like admiration. Like he's pulling a, an audience that is way beyond what all of us are used to even, you know, especially if you're a hardcore college football fan listening to a Twitter space in July. Like, I mean, this is like, <laughs> like he, he is attracting an audience that is just unreal. And, uh, but yeah, and this is, this is, this is playing to that audience. Like it's the only way you can describe it or people who are familiar with brand names. Cause that's again, the only reason I can figure out why uh, USC is in some of these rankings. Okay. I want to point something out. Western Kentucky has had more game footage than West Virginia. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Well, everyone loves you. Know, everyone loves that mascot, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it, the only thing is, everyone's joking. It's like we're just paying for the pain. We're just paying for Alston. That's all. That's it. Because yeah. I mean, because that was the whole thing. He he originally one of the things he was suing was EA because he mm -hmm. was pissed that he was on the back of the game and he didn't get any money whatsoever. And they their answer was, well, we don't pay for players on the back of the cover. That that was their actual response, and so because uh, I think uh, RG three got paid significantly after he graduated, mm -hmm. yeah. And they, and their their company policy is well, we only pay the players on the front <laughs> after they graduate, and so he mm -hmm. got nothing, and that was so. Yeah, we're just everyone on the discords for WV. We're like, yeah, we're all just paying for Austin right now. Yeah. EA hates us. <laughs> um, I love it. No, I, I can see that though. I can see that. But hey, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing West Virginia. It's an interesting season for the Big 12, though. So, like, again, it's like, going to be crazy. It's no, no, like, crazy. they are the hardest conference to peg right now. And I mean, I hope I haven't paid, I honestly haven't kept up, but I mean, I just saw like yesterday, Ollie Gordon, you know, obviously one of the stars of the conference, got arrested uh, for a potential DUI. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. I'm on a, I'm on a Big 12 Discord. And Man, been, I hope he can a play. Lot of that would be a shame that. to not have him on the field, but I don't know the severity of it. I mean, I don't know all of that. I mean, we haven't even talked about yeah. what on earth is happening at Utah State for the record. Like that was the story that today that you know. Yeah. Oh, he uh, Blake Anderson isn't coming is is on leave. Oh, and by the way, he's probably not coming back. And oh, it's a <laughs> Title IX violation. And you know, all these kind of came up. And we're all like, didn't he just have a kid like yesterday? Yeah. You know, um, 
Oof, it is, uh, and his whole life has been just tragedy. I mean, if those who know his, his, uh, uh, he had his, he was married to someone who died just horribly, uh, to, to, I think it was cancer when he was at Arkansas state. So it kind of was changing his scenery eventually and went to Utah state. And then, you know, man, I, I don't know what's going on there, but it's sounding ugly. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. But yeah um, I, I, all right. So last topic real quick. Yeah. Then. So people have, I've been looking at like, people are like kind of salivating, which teams from the ACC are going to jump ship to the big 12 when it fail skates. And one of the teams that people keep bringing up is NC state. But hmm. the problem is when I was looking at the numbers at like who, who would take who. So the word on the street is that the, uh, Big Ten, SEC, if they take, they'd probably only take two. They probably each, each conference. So that's four teams gone. So you can, and the Big 12, would, I can't see a world where they would take more than four. So if you sort kind of like the top brands in the ACC, you're looking at like Duke, UNC, Clemson, FSU, Miami, Louisville, Virginia Tech, and Pitt. Uh, so the thing is, though, if you do that, that's eight teams. So four of those are gone. Which of those teams? would you substitute florida state for i mean you could argue maybe duke but i mean are you going to turn down a basketball team like that maybe you'd argue pitt except for i mean obviously west virginia is going to protest that until <laughs> the end that like you, you got to take pitt we have to have pitt so it's kind of like what what team would the big 12 <laughs> even take in or would they f leave behind to try and take nc state of those eight teams i I couldn't see which one, any of those that they would say, no, nah, we're not taking Louisville. We're going to take NC State. No, we're not taking Virginia Tech. We're taking NC State. And I think for, NC State's in a real rough position right now because I can't see any of those teams being turned down instead to take NC State. Yeah, if you're limiting it to just a couple of teams, that becomes really problematic. Um, I do wonder, though, if we'll see kind of a voracious appetite if if the ACC were to come apart by some of these other conferences, you know, the, the thought is, and I, and again, I don't know the, how much, how much truth you can put behind it. But one of the rumors I'd heard is if it were to fly apart, then Stanford and Cal and Stanford in particular would supposedly lead this would try to reconstitute some version of a West coast conference again, um, uh, with you know, <laughs> the survivors. I don't know. Like it's going to turn into some weird nomadic universe where, you know, uh, where are these teams all gathering now until, until the seismic changes settle down and, and these tectonic plate conferences come together. Boy, that was an analogy that sort of came together on the fly. Um, you know, I want to, I want to give uh, just a couple of more folks chances to, to, to chime in because I've been super patient here. Yeah. You um, the floor. <laughs> uh, no, no problem. Hey, uh, uh, Caleb, what's going on? What's going on guys. Hey, uh, actually it's funny. You brought up, ACC and Stanford and Cal. That's kind of what I was thinking about as you guys were talking about uh, this realignment stuff. Because I've I come from the farming industry, mm -hmm. and almond price is terrible right now. Twelve years ago, the almond farmers were traveling the world, building mansions, buying more land because almond price was so good. But yeah. so it you know it goes in waves, and I kind of see college football. Doing you're from this. the you have to be from the Central Valley, by the way. You have to I, be from this. I'm Fresno State Bulldogs, baby. Go, yeah. Dogs. I saw Bulldogs. <laughs> I just realized okay, it's it's Fresno State because I grew up in Bakersfield. So, Khalifa, I know all the brands of options <laughs> and all that stuff. <laughs> oh, perfect. All right, man. Well, <laughs> well, we're family then. All right, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Central Valley, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm out in Kerman. Valley feeds, so. Valley feeds everybody. No one realizes how much of uh, our domestic produce comes from that part of the United States and the Midwest, mostly exports. So, yeah. Oh, it's, we have a good time out here, man. We, but, but, but anyway, sorry. I didn't mean to like, uh, distract yeah. that. When he said almond farming, I'm like, Oh, Boulder. Oh, Fresno state. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah. You got it right. So no, but I, you know, I'm also, I, I cheer for the West coast. I want mm -hmm. us to be successful. I don't think that it's sustainable for Cal and Stanford and USC and UCLA to play consistently across on the other side of the nation. Now I know I, I forget whose schedule I looked at, but some of them, some of those schedules are favorable. They get a lot of home games. Don't have to travel too, too much, but I mean, women's volleyball swim team, you know, I, if they're in those conferences, it's going to be really hard on those kids. And I just don't see it being sustainable. I don't know about you guys. 
Um, so, but it sounded like it's, you guys were going that way and that's kind of what I was getting to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm very curious to see how that goes. And I think a lot of, a lot of the, uh, and I, I kind of get the logic here. A lot of the administrators who had the opportunity to jump ship were like, look, why don't we just try it, get all the money we can. And if it doesn't work, we tried it, but at least we were in. And if it does work, I think they realize if it does work and you're left out, you know, you're in a real, you're, you're going to regret it bigger. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it could be just that. It could be that they uh, they go give it a try um, and then realize that, you know, honestly, most most of the programs just want the football and basketball and to some, to, you know, some of the other sports, but primarily football and especially men's basketball, that maybe there will be a negotiating point on putting some of those other programs elsewhere. And who knows, maybe we'll need to if just for the sake of, uh, surviving uh, this new financial model that we're entering because of obviously the the potential it hasn't been finalized but the potential uh, house settlement and and the way a lot of these things have been agreed to where they can make it work for football they can make it work for men's basketball probably women's basketball with the way it's going but it gets more complicated so maybe there is kind of a bifurcation where we put all of those sports and keep them the way they were and then create some sort of I'm 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 warming up to the idea that maybe they'll come up with a way to make like a super duper club model, like they're club sports, but it's not re like the staff is paid, you know. Um, they but they come up with some way to do it. But I don't want to get too speculative there. But uh, but that's something that has certainly come up. Andrew, I see your hand up, and John and Ski Mask Smurphy. I think you all wanted to chime in on this one. Yeah, I I'll just say that if it doesn't go to that bifurcation model that you mentioned. Um, my, I mean, y'all, if you want, you can, uh, you know, make a note of this and come back to me in however many years, but my prediction is that in, we'll say I'll split the difference 30 years within 30 years, we're going to have a complete collapse of this current system and we're going to start going back to more regionalized conferences i think by that point streaming or whatever however we're watching tv and sports by then will just kind of level the playing field to the point where it's not worth the money for these schools to jet across the country and again that's if the bifurcation model doesn't happen if that's the case then we're all screwed but uh i don't know i'm thinking like within 30 years this is all going to collapse and then we'll we'll get back to college football the way that it should be or mad max which would also be quite fascinating um john <laughs> actually that's that's funny you mentioned that by the way i, I will check up on you in 30 years sir uh, <laughs> Hey, I, I, I've, I'm reaching the age where in 30 years, I'm like, I'll probably be there. You know, I'll probably be around. <laughs> you, know, you start like doing that math. I'm like, I'd be like almost 75, you know? <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll, I'll be 62 in 30 years. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'm still around by then. Yeah. Is that, is that over or under Haley's comment coming? Back? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. So the point I was going to make, um, I know someone's mentioning earlier, what, you know, what was the finding moment to, you know, all this uh, conference realignment to me, <clears throat> hate to go like super big picture answer here, but I really think it comes down to satellite television coming into the foreview of American homes. You know, the old days of where you just watched a couple of teams on, on cable television or one or two channels went quickly away where you could watch all the teams all the time. And it kept expanding and getting bigger and bigger. And, and then really started with this idea of, uh, you know, teams moving up to the FBS from the FCS because the money kept getting bigger and bigger. And then, then the pots and certain conferences got bigger for certain ones. And I think it really started snowballing. I, I think the true beginning of the end, if you want to think of it that way, I think it was truly when the West Coast Conference and the Big East died as football conferences. I think once that happened, I think it was just a very slow downhill uh, boulder going down the cliff type moment to where we are right now. All right, doom and gloom. Uh, Ski Mask, what was your thought on this before we move on? Oh, uh, yeah, I was going to say to, I forgot who it was, which person was talking about the almonds and how it was great Caleb. at one point. Yeah, it was Caleb. Caleb. And then it sort of um, 
then it's sort of dried up now. I think going back to like we talked some, at some point, maybe over a month ago, we talked about how um, the bidding for the TV contracts wasn't as big as we thought it was for the college football playoff. Mm-hmm. And sort of like ESPN was sort of the only person who wanted it. And sort of I think he has a point that at some point the money's going to level off and it's not going to be as expansive as it as it's been getting recently. And then at some point, something's going to have to give and probably all these teams are going to have to reset themselves back with conferences that make sense for all sports or at least, like you said, just split off football and basketball to do their own thing and let the rest of the sports just make small regional conferences. I love it. I'm just thinking like instead we're going to see all the universities pool their money in science together and come up with a way to truly explore the universe with faster and light travel so that they can find a new TV market. Um, <laughs> that, really, it's only to do that. We're going to get the, the Gorlax. Big 12's the, already got that. We already got the Southwest Conference, the Big 8, and the Big East 2.0 basically going on in one <laughs> conference. I love it. Oh, man, this is great stuff. Let me see here. Elizabeth, you've been super patient. What's on your mind? I have been super patient. Yes. Well, I've been I've been thinking about the NIL, and I feel a little bit differently now. I think, you know, money doesn't equal success, and having more money doesn't guarantee better coaching or player performance on the field. I'll use <laughs> Texas Ohio's, A&M. Prove that. Sorry. I, I was going to say my two examples are Ohio State and Texas A&M. So, Ohio State has done that badly. I'm <laughs> It's like, 2014. Cool. Okay, 2014, their last natural nat- national championship, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's been a little while. And I thought, you know, I think we're so worried about the NIL and how it's like, you know, destroying college football. But there's so many other things that we need to consider. Um, and again, money doesn't guarantee it attracts talented players, but that doesn't mean they're going to be successful in the field and team culture team cohesion do they get along and then the fun part of injuries and luck yeah. you know so there's a lot of other elements that i think we're going to be just fine so i know we've been really concerned about it and um yeah so that's just my con- small contribution for uh for what i think is going to happen i think we're going to be fine because like you said a and m is a perfect example of like oh let's pay our coach like 90 million dollars and it's going to guarantee a you know series of national championships and it's like mm. and he got fired for what eight wins i'm like oh, yeah i would give anything for eight wins for arkansas are you kidding me there there's no better job than being a fired college football coach i, uh, wanted, I, I should have done that we should program. have all done that everybody on here <laughs> yeah let's all go coach like major teams and get fired that's our goal <laughs> i know <laughs> ea sports will let us try that now <laughs> Oh, I love it. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, I I know we we will get to everyone, and I apologize. I see uh, um, Dr. Pecco, eh, Dr. Pepper Bucko. How are you doing, my pit friend? Good, good. What's going on? What's on your mind? Mm, I don't know. Uh, so uh, what? What do you see Pitt as? Let's, I guess, say, like, refresh it, I guess. Like, going into this season? <laughs> yeah, because I saw recently that they're betting on, they're putting them as the second worst team in the ACC. So. Hey, gosh. I'm not sure where I'd put them right now. Second worst. The problem is it's just so hard to tell what exactly is happening under Narduzzi right now. And Cade Bell... We'll see if he can get that offense moving as their new offensive coordinator. Um, it certainly uh, didn't look great when, of course, you uh, you lose a great, you know, uh, one of the best players on the defense. He says, I need to be on a team that's going to win now. And then it goes to Colorado, which kind of raised some eyebrows. Maybe he also saw the, he maybe saw an early EA sports ranking and he's like, I got to be on that defense. Um, but uh, you know, I, I don't know what to talk about. Like, yeah, no, I mean, but that's the thing. I mean, I mean, it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a battle. I think, you know, I, I was, there's another, I do another show with uh, Sean J. Raja of CBS Sports. We do it for a, like a more formal podcast. I remember we were talking, we broke down each conference and we tried to classify each team and, uh, and with guests. So I actually was just the host. I got to only be the tiebreaker. Um, so we had newspaper reporters from the different conferences um, under that, you know, the AL, pardon me, the, uh, 
advanced media. So like we had someone from Syracuse.com. We had someone who covers Louisville uh, do the, the, as our two ACC guests. And I remember with, with Pitt, it was tricky because it's so weird to say, you know, are they a college football contender? Are they middle tier? Are they bottom tier? And we were like, well, they're probably bottom tier, but they have a chance to fight back up to the middle tier. But it's just so unclear they're, what's they're, going on at Pitt right now. Their quarterback is a lot better than last year. Their offensive line could hopefully stay healthy. That That's what I found, like, what I think the problems was last year. Although the coordinating was also terrible, too. So Yeah. Well, we'll see. I always yeah. appreciate hearing from you here, though. Um, but Pitt's a fascinating one. It, Pitt is fun when they're good because uh, there was a point where Pitt and Michigan State were like the teams that people thought if they expand the playoff, those are the two teams that are going to benefit. Now it's it's Ole Miss and Penn State, but I still think mm-hmm. Pitt has the ability to climb back up, but we're just going to have to see more from them and see how that goes. I just want to chime in really quick. I, yep. I, I, I noticed or I noticed um a connection point between something I wanted to say earlier, but if the big 12 poaches teams from the ACC, please for the love of all that is holy, please pick another team that is on the East coast. I really, as a UCF fan, it's a bummer that the closest team to us is West Virginia. I'm hoping we get something out of like Georgia tech or, or North Carolina state or something because Oh boy, that tra- that travel sucks. Um, I see unknown's hand up, and then I'd, I'll go to our our friend Sam Houston Sports Talk. I think I mean like going to the guys who just spoke just now is quite. I mean, the point I think I mean like Miami's got to go somewhere, right? I don't think like Miami's a brand. I hate to use that term because you. Know, but I don't think Miami is the type of program, both in like baseball, basketball, and football, just to stay pat. I think they might just go to the Big Twelve. I mean, they're trying to. I agree. I, I'd be shocked if they get totally left out of everything because Miami is still a major, major brand. I mean, I think the only schools that might legitimately get left out of everyone. I mean, because I know like the SEC would want to get up to twenty. Um, I mean, I think the only schools that might get left out would be like what, like Wake, Wake. Forest, Syracuse, Boston College. Yeah, they're the more awkward ones. I agree there. And depending on how they do SMU, but I mean, everyone just saw SMU will pay whatever it takes. So, you know, maybe they're, it's like, yeah, cool. <laughs> they're the fun, rich kid. That That's the hookup on the on uh, things you may need. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, I agree with you on that. I do. And I'm very curious to see what would happen to Miami if something like that were to occur. Um, Sam Houston Sports Talk. And then, hey, Max, back up. So we'll get to you as well, I promise. Hey, what's going on? Uh, I just had a quick question. I, I was yeah. just kind of curious. Y'all were kind of talking about realignment and all that. I'm, it's, and we're kind of, you know, wondering what the future holds. I was just wondering, what does a FBS program, a small FBS program like Sam Houston, need? What do those kind of programs need to do in order to to survive and or I guess you can put it, make sure they don't get screwed over if some if you know, bigger realignment was to happen or if it is going to happen to where the power four separate themselves from the group of five. Yeah, I, huh? well, there's, it it kind of stinks because if the power four decide to separate, there's nothing any of the G, uh, the the, uh, G5 can do. But I think really at this point, you just have to, the model is to build your program up so that, and it's an interesting question because do you keep trying to build up a program that might be in a kind of a pick me situation? Like, uh, you know, obviously there's teams that have moved up and successfully done it. Um, TCU historically, and then you have schools more recently, like obviously UCF, Cincy, et cetera. Um, and at the same time, you know, you know, we've seen what James Madison did to bring themselves up from FCS. They really built a, a firm foundation to be a strong G5 team. Now, whether or not it's financially sensible for some of these G5 programs to do it, if there's eventually going to be a cap, because that's my question. Like, is there eventually going to be a, a sort of the market will only support so many teams past a certain point uh, in terms of how they elevate? Because it's an interesting trickle-down effect. I talked about this just 
one of the observations I had in a kind of an unusual aspect, but two months ago, um, I went to an exhibition game and a college exhibition game where the best team in Japan came and played a mediocre NAIA team. And the, I, to my surprise, the second half, they, they played close games in the eighties, but they hadn't played in 30 years. At this point, the NAIA, NAIA team was much more, um, much more, uh, I would say conditioned to, to last the entire, to last the full 60 minutes and all of that stuff. And then I realized what we've been seeing is, you know, the top, top programs in college football are trying to be as close, bring their players as close to the NFL as they can. So, you know, they're developing them out. I mean, no one will question the fact that in the last 40 years, even the last 10 years, the, uh, the physical conditioning of players is just, we've improved it. Sports medicine is tremendous. And then, you know, Everyone wants to chase that. So, you know, part of it's to market to the players, especially when you couldn't, you know, pay them like you could before. Hey, come, we've got all these facilities. You could come to a G5 program that's training you'd like almost exactly like they do at the FBS programs um, and maybe FBS programs more recently. And, and then, you know, D2 or FCS is doing that. D2 is doing that. Even some of the stronger D3 programs are trying to chase that. Not the same level. Um, but but they are trying to chase it. And to an extent, the NAIA, which is somewhere similar to D2 and a little bit like D3, um, they'd been doing that too. So that by the time, you know, Japan was like frozen in time. So like 30 years later, that same kind of team shows up and one team is just way better conditioned than the other at this point. And I'm I'm saying that story because I'm thinking at what point financially is it just not worth the returns? Um, but all of that said, I think programs at the, uh, the G5 need to just continue to develop out and try and build programs that can compete with each other. Um, but the decision to move up, that's such a, that's such a burden. That is such a difficult one. The only team right now, there are two teams that seem to be setting themselves up, and I don't know if it'll pay off. One of them right now, and they've been trying it for a long time for the record. If people have paid attention Memphis has always been in the background. They've always had the, the FedEx guy saying, like, whatever it'll take, I'll just throw down the money. And then it came up this offseason because they were able to keep so much of their team because the NIL money that that guy threw down basically made sure Memphis didn't lose anybody crucial uh, to the uh, to the portal this year. Um, and they're willing to, and the city's now throwing money and they're going to finally fix the Liberty Bowl, which, I mean, <laughs> What was it, a couple of seasons ago? They didn't even have run. They didn't have potable water uh, during the actual game. Uh, they had a porta pot. I don't think they had any water. Now that I'm thinking about. It. I think they had porta potties. Um, but you know, again, so they're throwing money at that program. USF has been gradually building themselves up. They seem to have been trying to follow the model UCF did. Um, obviously, well after the fact. Maybe they'll reach that point. They're a big enough university in a big enough market. Um, in a fertile recruiting ground that if they were to go in that direction, they could. But I think for a lot of the G5 programs, it is going to be an interesting question. Do we just make sure we focus on competing with each other, knowing that it's sometimes good enough to win? You know, um, you could be like Liberty. Liberty's thrown so much money at that program. They're basically a P4 program just sort of floating around in G5 because none of the, the P4 want them uh, because of, of all the baggage that's involved there. Um, but yeah, is there a point where is it worth it? Um, and I don't know that that's, you've touched on one of the great existential questions of this sport. Like, is it worth it for some of these programs? And at what point, what is good enough? And that's like what North Dakota state's perfectly happy staying at FCS. Everyone always would ask that, like, are you going to move up? They're like, we're good. <laughs> you know, we are the Kings of Fargo. Um, people love us here. You know, we, we have a market, you know, we've grown even a national brand of sorts. Um, so that might be the other question. Is that, is that the better thing to do? But I love the question, but it doesn't have a, the straightest answer of them all. I want to let Mac chime in only because he's been, we, I watched him try to get, like we've had issues getting him connected. Um, Mac, what's on your mind? Yeah, that was me with my AirPods. Sorry no about worries. that. So, so I do think uh, a few teams leave the ACC, but then we kind of get like a Southwest Conference Big 12 thing with the ACC and we bring back the Metro. And I think it's Syracuse, UConn, Pitt, Virginia Tech, NC State, Wake, Louisville. And then they add Memphis, Tulane, SMU, USF. And then when the big 12 media deal is up, they go and poach West Virginia, Cincy, and UCF. Hmm. That's not a, that's an interesting thought. That's certainly an interesting way of looking at it. I didn't thought of that one. Um, and it is fun to try and figure out 
especially of the of the teams that would be kind of caught in the lurch, which ones would be best to band together um, and which university leaders would, would be the ones to kind of lead that. But that's a fascinating one. I hadn't thought about that, especially to see that reconstituting, it, especially if they assemble something that is competitive enough to to attack the the Big 12 when the, the, that opening comes up later on, when every TV media deal comes up. I mean, that's part of why, again, the Pac-12 collapsed when it did. The, the media deal came up for renegotiation. Um, let's see here. I see a hand I up. Have, yeah. uh, oh, go ahead. Keep going. No problem. Oh, sorry about that. And then I have an idea as far as the cross-country travel for stuff. Maybe we create dynamic scheduling for like fall sports. So let's say, for example, Rutgers at USC. When that weekend they play, they play in all sports. So let's say Rutgers takes all their fall teams over to California to play. So basketball, soccer, you name it. That's not a bad idea. And I'm very curious. I bet they're going to be really open to uh, – they're going to do – they're going to be really open to, like, creative ideas of trying to make that work. Because no one wants to see those teams, I think, entirely leave. Um, or, or probably those programs will have to leave the conference because they don't work. But – yeah, it's going to take some creative, uh, some creative ideas to make that happen. I see a couple of hands up here. Nate, then Ski Mask Smurphy, and then we'll get to our, our friend Coach Clark. Hey, uh, so by the way, I, we, we, nobody mentioned this yet, but yesterday was Bobby Vanilla Day. And yes! And that's just a historic thing in, yeah. in our country. So for anybody that doesn't know, he was a Mets player that got bought out by the New York Mets in 2000. And every year on July 1st, he gets paid a million dollars. And that runs until like the 2030s, like 2035 <laughs> yes. or something. It's it's outrageous because he he's the patron played. saint of those kinds of deals. He absolutely yeah, yeah. is. And Pray the Bobby Bonilla that you get years. that kind of a deal. Yeah. But my, uh, my question was, I wanted to kind of understand um, why, why SMU is – you know, why are they where they're at? Like, why do they get put in the ACC? Um, I just never, I've never really understood why, you know, I know they had the death penalty in the eighties or whenever. Um, but you know, you look at Penn state, they had their issue, maybe not as severe, uh, but they were able to come back from that. I've never understood why, why SMU has never been able to kind of like grow and why nobody of the bigger conferences wanted them before, like, you know, last year where the ACC kind of had to take them. And the biggest thing, too, is after Texas and Oklahoma left, why weren't they, you know, interested in taking them in the Big 12? Because with Oklahoma leaving and also Texas, of course, you're losing a lot of the Dallas market for recruiting. And I know TCU is right there, but you I, I don't know. I thought you could have kind of kept some of the Dallas market of recruiting um, by getting SMU. So I've just I've never really understood. I know they have a lot of money from their alumni base, um, um, you know, people that are very successful. So it's something I've never been able to understand why. Well, yeah, they have mad money, that's for sure. And that's what got them in the trouble in the first place. You know, the uh, the death penalty, when it hit them, the NCAA basically kind of tacitly understood that that was a bad penalty. Like, it was way more damaging than they had even realized. So the understanding was, even when, when even I mean, arguably much, much worse things were happening, like at Penn State and some of these other places, they were never going to throw that down at any team again, um, just because it was it really threw them in in a a long period of decline. And quite frankly, part of it then is just mismanagement afterwards, uh, to some extent. Because then we watched, you know, they watched their rival TCU cross down, climb up from being you know a WAC team to a Mountain West team to a Big Twelve team, um, and obviously you know runners up a couple of seasons ago in the national championship game. So. Um, the, now, why it took so long, there's a lot of reasons there. Just honestly, they never really had great coaches. And then they started to get serious about it around the time June Jones was there. I'm going to give them some credit. And then uh, June Jones, it's a whole other story. But they started to build that up. Obviously, Sonny Dykes did some good work there. Um, and then himself got hired away. Uh, this season will be interesting. Obviously, as I've said, Preston Stone, they've got a good quarterback there who with that offense could be interesting. Although the problem is they were willing, of course, to buy their way into the ACC and take no money for doing it. Um, and then I think the ACC just finally had to ask itself, you know, we're not going to, it's not going to cost us really anything. And we're going to get some access to Texas. And it made a reasonable sense to them. And I kind of get that. Um, yeah. 
But but why didn't the Big Twelve have any interest in them? And I think it's I, just they don't want to necessarily double down in that state anymore, or triple whatever, so really? triple down. I think it had to do with the fact the desire to get. I think more because a lot of what had shifted in the the, uh, the conference changes, especially in the last ten years, is the, the conferences were looking for the biggest splashes for national TV audiences. That's why the idea of bringing Texas and Oklahoma those are they always pull a national audience because they're just big brands, and that really was underlined when USC and UCLA were what the Big Ten were interested in because. Like them or hate them, they bring in a lot of attention. As I joke, like you go in abroad and UCLA suddenly appears everywhere. Like you're just kind of like, I did not realize UCLA was this big of a brand outside of the United States. It absolutely is. Absolutely is. Um, so again, that was kind of the 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 reasoning of, of a lot of these choices. Um, and then the ACC was merely also the uh, SMU took advantage of the fact that the ACC needed to backfill because they knew that they are uh, they were quite aware that they could slowly come apart. And the TV deal that was, again, this has to do with wonderful lawyers and contracts, the TV deal that was written is they can't renegotiate it as long as the team stays among like X number of teams. So not which teams, just the total number. So by adding three new teams, suddenly it's like, hey, if we lose a few, we might survive this thing after all. Um, uh, that was some of the motivation for it that was discussed when they decided to add uh, the three teams that they did. But again, that one just felt more like them trying to survive uh, rather than, you know, rather than a lot of logic going on there. So that was the, the ACC oh, sorry, trying to survive or, or SMU trying to survive? Oh, a ACC. SMU was just happy to join anybody. S SMU was just, yeah, if it's ACC, it's ACC. You know, we'll, we'll happily, you know, be members of the Atlantic Coast Midwest Division. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess with the, the way the money works out, because yeah, they're they're pretty much paying to be in the ACC. Will it work out in the long term for them, as opposed to staying in the American? This is just dumb Texas oil money going for it broke, baby. But that's what <laughs> that's what this is, you know. Fair enough. Um, and, and to be fair, to be fair, maybe one day they'll start to get money out of it, and certainly they know that the uh, they'll get a higher. I mean, the, the TV deal for the ACC is simply just better than the American. So they're, they'll be higher profile. I don't think anyone will doubt that. Um, and then if things shake up more, at least now they're on the big boy table. You know, even though they brought their own lunch, <laughs> they brought their own lunch. <laughs> they brought everything and they paid for the probably the drinks for the whole table. Um, you know, <laughs> like everyone loves uh, SMU when they show up. They got their polo shirt, their uh you know, the collars pop. They they got the hookup. Their dad's a lawyer. You know everything. You know, I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe their plan is join the ACC, get some more exposure, then wait for that to implode, <laughs> and then finally join the Big Twelve or uh, SEC in that yeah. way through the back door. Smart idea. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna. Hey, ski mask. I'm gonna get to you, and then Andrew, and then we want to get to Coach Clark. Uh, ski mask. Oh wait, there you go. Oh yeah, I forgot I had my hand up. That was. I can't remember what my original comment's going to be about. But, uh, yeah, as, as from you, uh, yeah, you, you can just give me. Okay, no problem. Andrew, what's on your mind? Oh, I was just going to say, you know, as as nuanced and good as your opinion is on as to uh, why SMU took so long to get back, I think I have the Occam's razor here. So in 2009, the infamous Lee Corso moment was Houston against SMU. And SMU had been in the doldrums to that point. But after that game, they went five and one and got their first winning, their third, second winning season since the death penalty. And since then, they have been on a meteoric rise. They've gone to one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten bowl games since then. So, I think SMU has uh, Lee Corso's lo loose lips to th uh, thank for that one. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting theory for sure. Uh, Coach Clark, how are you doing, man? It's been a minute. Yeah, uh, yeah, guy. Yeah, thanks, Bob. It's it's been a while, but. I've uh, I've been changing my career around, so I've been focused on that. I just got hired to be 
the outside linebackers coach at Westwood High School in Palestine, Texas. So I just got moved down. Congrats. You know, it was time for me to move on. And there's two things I say that's not that I think need to be fixed with college football. You know, you know, conference realignment in itself isn't bad, but the problem is every time we do it, someone gets a, a major conference gets gets murdered. And going back to what we said about Southern Methodist, you know, the, they were in the Southwest Conference. I'm the only person I think that I know that owns a Southwest Conference T-shirt. It's in my laundry hamper currently. It was basically every school in Texas minus Rice and mm-hmm. UTEP and you know, you know. You know uh well oh rice was in the southwest yeah rice was in the southwest conference yeah yeah but not utep yeah but like pretty much everyone except utep and and a few other people plus arkansas and it was the premier conference so like so all of darrell royals national championships southwest conference the pony express southwest conference uh mike singletary when he played middle linebacker at baylor southwest conference um you know the the freddie joe the my all-american story yeah, UT Southwest Conference, uh, but basically they they never wanted to instill death penalty. It, so SMU used to be on the top. I think they were 1982 national champions, or they had a share of it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but you know, death penalty happens. It knocks them off, and, and all those other programs. Houston was a was a was a power five program. Rice power five pro a reputable power power five program. Arkansas was was one of the better programs in the Southwest. It was the only one that wasn't a Texas school. You know, um, it, it, it was a conference of conferences, and so the death penalty about what well, when they knock knock SMU lower than whale droppings. It hurt the other teams in that conference, and it ultimately led, it, it led to its demise. Like Houston was a founding, ended up joint, going from being a nationally ranked powerhouse in the 90s to being part of Conference USA. Same thing with SMU, uh, same thing with Rice. You know, Rice is kind of, you know, they're a private school, and, and they got to compete with Houston for recruits, two, two big D1 programs in the same town. But they've, they haven't recovered from that, you know. And it's, mm-hmm. it's one of my beasts with this conference realignment. We've gone chasing a dollar sign and not, I don't think it's been thought through very well. You know, there's some people that have made some valid points. I agree with Chip Kelly that, you know, maybe we should just try this little experiment for football. You know, it's going to be really tough for travel on the title nine and all the Olympic sports, you know, I mean, you know, it used to be, you know, or university of Oregon track and field would take bus rides to go compete against USC and Washington and, you know, Cal and all that stuff. Now they're going to have to go, go to Rutgers and Penn state. Um, and, but I think there's going to be silver lining in this. The mountain West is going to be the little engine that could, you know, with the expansion of the playoffs, I think we're going to see, you know, a program's advancement in the, in the championship season, depend more on their merits and their coaching rat, you know, rather than their G five or, you know, or, or, or their P four, for status. I'm really excited to watch the UNLV run in Rebels with Barry Odom and the go go offense is fun stuff. Uh, other 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 than that, you, you know, just be careful what you wish for because you might get it. We might see the Pac twelve make a comeback in two, three years. We could. It'll be interesting to see what happens as these conferences kind of develop you know, out. There's a few I could probably I could probably make an educated guess that some programs are going to do well. You know, like like Arizona, they've got that they got Brent Brennan and a bunch of ex Beavers on his coaching staff, mm-hmm. you know Lyle Moivau and uh, Coach Joe, a few other people I know. Um, but uh, I think a lot of them might find out the grass isn't always greener on the other side and start get, getting the snot kicked out of them. It's like, do you want to be competitive or do you want to be a punching bag? You know. I think I'll, uh, it's interesting. Money, I think, is making the biggest decision, not not on field stuff at this point. But uh, I hear you. Absolutely. It was I mean, good hearing from you, man. Hey, congratulations on the new position. I hope well, and really, I'll uh, say another thing about that. Oh, one, yeah, thing, one thing, the second gripe I have with college football right now is the reason I'm, I decided, I had a friend that advised me to go to Texas and coach high school ball. I'm probably going to be making, all, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't really talk about my, my salary much, but it looks like I'm going to be making, starting out more money than a lot of defensive coordinators between NAIA and D2 right now, you know, as a position coach at a high school, you know, I mean, that's one of hey, my, in Texas, to be fair, it is Texas, but that's why, at the same time, that's still high school. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and one thing they need to think about with college football, maybe with the exception of the head coach and some of the coordinators, they need to do a better job taking care of the coaches that are starting out. Because I was looking at, you know, my coaching stipends was a lot more cash than a lot of restricted earnings positions or entry level positions, you know, and I'm 35 years old. It was getting old living like a college kid and, you know, sharing in a, a one bedroom apartment with four dudes, um, you know, stuff like that. It's, you know, it was time. And I never I never signed a piece of paper that said I had to live in poverty. So if they want to fix college football, one thing they're going to need to do is, a bet, t- you know, is better is fun- funding for coaches, coaching staffs. You know, they, I mean, it was good. They got rid of that rule that analysts can't coach at practice. You can have as many as you want, but we can't live in a broom closet. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. you no. Know, that's and it's, it's a trend. I'm 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 not the first person to go this route. There are, you know, I'm you know, if I go to a coach's clinic, just amongst the high school coaches, I'm not going to be the smartest guy in the room because there's a lot of guys that coach college for a little bit, and they've gone to the high school level, you know, and uh, it's like we gotta we gotta make a living, man. It it's it's uh, I'm I'm just a member of the wagon train. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, Coach Clark. It's great hearing from you. Yeah. Let's see here. I see some hands up, and then I'm going to do kind of a roundup of some of the other news items I wanted just to touch on. But, John. Uh, well, first of all, um, I'm hearing that that type of money, Coach. Uh, you guys hiring for Water Boys? I mean, I'm, I wouldn't mind working for <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, uh, but But my more serious question, uh, I know 4th of July is this Thursday. Um, sir, do you have a preferred uh, 4th of July food that you like to go your, – what's your go-to on, uh, on the 4th? Oh, you asking me? Oh, or, yes, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh man, hey, coach, coach, you can answer too. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead if you want to, Coach Clark. Uh, no, nothing, nothing beats nothing beats a Polish dog. <laughs> I was or, close. Or a, I was going to go Amber brat. Or, or I, Amber, I, I'm, yeah. I'm a sucker for brats ever since I moved to Minnesota. You got the Upper Midwest. It's all about those brats. You, you, know, you soak them in beer and all that stuff. My goodness, it's just it's heaven on earth. But I, I don't mind anything off the grill, really. Uh, I'm pretty simple when it comes to this stuff. Like, don't get me wrong. I have the most bougie food taste you'll ever see. Like, I, I, you know, I've been in plenty of Michelin restaurants. But when it comes to that, I, I, I like to I like a good old brat. Can't beat that. It's hard to beat that. I'd say that. Let's see here. Uh, Ski Masks Murphy and then Nate. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to sort of go to co- Coach's point about a. Uh, sort of the collapse of the that was the Southwest Southwest Conference with SMU and the Death Penalty. Well on the backside, especially when you talk about chasing money, sort of that's the death penalty with SMU is basically what created the Big Twelve and the Big Twelve was basically handpicked by ESPN. Between the Big Eight and Southwest Conference, ESPN basically said, you know, these are the teams we want in a TV package. You guys figure it out. So the sort of thing, so the money sort of always been there, but now it's a little bit more upfront, unfortunately. That too, too. And then in the nineties, we had those, those TV net, those college TV networks kick off, you know, like the big 12 network, what yada, yada. And the Southwest wasn't in line for whatever reason, according to the every documentary I've watched on the Pony Express was not, was not included in that. You know, so you take a prestigious conference that that one time ruled the roost at football and it just disappeared. And, you know, legitimate programs like Houston, Rice, uh, Baylor kind of fell off the map for a good long while after that. SMU was not lower than whale droppings and whatnot. Yeah, and I think this sort of coincided right around the time when he got rid of the, uh, the NCAA TV package. That sort of Notre Dame sort of started the breakaway from when he sort of were forced, what I suppose were TV channels were sort of forced to show n- not as many large schools as they probably wanted to, like they have now. They were sort of forced into showing some of the more local and small schools in order to get the big schools. So I think everything sort of just unraveled all together at the same time. Absolutely. Nate, what's on your mind? Uh, this is a question, kind of comment, Tanya, to Coach. Um, I saw this today. I can't remember if it was on Chris Long's Greenlight Pod or from Pat McAfee, but there was something I saw about how, um, I guess, how in, in college football they're going to have to get rid of walk-ons um, because I guess like how the NIL stuff is, is like being working out. 
and how I think it was Kirby Smart and um, Lane Kiffin, they were saying it's – they like – we don't want to get rid of walk-ons. I will literally take part of my salary and, and like provide that money for walk-ons to have walk-on players. So I don't know if you heard anything about that and kind of what that, you know, who deal deal is about. And, Cause I kind of plays a part of like the whole coaching staff thing or whatever, and how the money's being distributed. Well, uh, you got anything to say on that, Bob? Yeah, you know, the I understand why a lot of programs want to keep as many walk-ins as possible only because there is some way to tuck players in there and to kind of, um, you know, if you're ever short, especially in some of the key positions, um, this isn't like the pros where quite yet, where if, if you know, those rosters on the NFL are obviously much smaller, but if you get into a pinch, you can go out and just find a free agent or something like that. We haven't quite reached that or maybe we have them. I'm not sure if the transfer window would allow that. Um, so that there's a lot of reasons why that that's not popular. Um, I'm not sure if that is inevitably what happens or if they're just going to put, I wonder if they'll instead, and I've heard this might be it, instead they'll just expand the roster limit, like the scholarship roster limit might be the other direction um, because the scholarships kind of start to become a little hazy in this new system. Um, so maybe they'll just put a hard cap on a total number and just however you want to distribute it within a program. You figure out how you're funding the students that are there. Um, that might be the alternative. But yeah, no, it's I've heard this and I'm not sure where they're going to go with it. But I know the I know at least some of the motivations for why they might not want to why some of the coaches especially are not necessarily fans of that. Well, what I had to say about that is my. Uh... I was logging from before I, I, I was still in Oregon to, to pay for my trip to Texas. I was logging for my uncle and one of his grandkids, you know, was dating Corey Stover, who was an all Pac-12 linebacker slash edge rusher. You know, and and uh, Oregon and I would have, you know, if that was the mentality, he wouldn't have been on the team because Oregon State traditionally and like schools like Nebraska walk on you. They've had guys that have come that have been half a star, no star recruits come through and become some serious athletes, you know, all American stuff like that. I think that'd be, that would defeat the purpose of what college football is about. We all like it. We all like our underdogs. We all like our rags to riches and our Cinderella stories, you know, and I, th I think that'd be about a travesty. And on top, you know what I think is the biggest travesty in NIL. I've been waiting for it to happen. I even hit him up on Twitter. I hop has done nothing with an offensive line yet. That is a, <laughs> that is a crying shame. It's like yeah, absolutely. You think they'd be smart about that because that's college priced food. I mean, like I think the last time I went to an IHOP was in college, and I'm thinking about it. But yeah, no, I love that idea. There, you like, can't. Sorry, Bob. No, go ahead. No, no, please. You can't tell ahead. me there's not an I offensive line out there. Five guys on any squad in America that aren't worthy of an IHOP and ILB. Or like every time they have a pancake, like, you know, I don't think you can actually, you still can't link it to actual like on-field performance. And I, I think that's okay. That that gets complicated, but yeah, absolutely. I love it. That's a great one. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm going to quickly round. Oh, go ahead. I, I wanted to add one last quick tidbit about walk-ons. Um, so I found out like a few weeks ago, the Texas Longhorns, our kicker, Burt Auburn, he was a walk-on until like a few weeks ago. He finally just got a scholarship. That's a classic avenue. Like it's it, the kickers who don't who earn their scholarships. That that they are always one of the the most common. I want to say, especially when they start to throw those videos on social, it's it's the kickers that that are oftentimes the winners in those. Because to be a scholarship kicker means you're some level of magnificent, um, a lot of ways. Uh, oh, hey, ski mask. I see your hand up too. Before I start doing a roundup. Yeah, just a comment on walk-ons from two sides. From someone who was kicking in high school who was thinking about trying to become a collegiate kicker at the D1 level, out of kickers and punters, 80% of them are not on scholarship. They're only on scholarship if they're if the coaches decided they're kicking that season. So everybody else is just out there praying to earn the scholarship, unfortunately. And the second yeah. point, from, from when I've talked to people when I was all on campus and other friends from high school went to go play in school. I, I think the reason Kirby Smart and some other coaches want to keep walk-ons is there you need to you need to have bodies to throw out for practice. And and the biggest thing is that typically walk-ons are the people who bring up the grade level 
for the overall GPA of the team to so the NCAA doesn't look at your program and say you guys aren't, you know, academically adequate, especially on basketball teams. It's I've known people <laughs> who have tried to be walk ons and have been told your GPA is too low. And they're like, but I have a two point six. It's like, no, you're a walk on. I need your GPA to be above a three oh for a <laughs> reason. <laughs> Hey, you know, it'll get you into a bowl game on occasion sometimes. So, yeah, hey, it's all the walk ons are the ones earning those bowl tickets for those five and seven teams. You know, I love it. That's great. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's a good note. I like that one. So, I've got a couple of news and notes I want to get through really quick before I forget. So, the other funny news today, kind of in fact, I mean, the serious news, whatever's going on with Blake Anderson at Utah State, they let him go. And it seems like it's a Title IX violation. The details haven't come out yet. We're going to find out almost certainly. And some of the rumors I've been told are ugly, but we'll set that one aside. Um, Clebson, uh, apparently uh, ACC requested to move the uh, Palmetto Bowl to Black Friday. That's the the, uh, the non-conference rivalry with South Carolina. Obviously a major game. There have been upsets in it, all of that stuff. So they're going to keep that game where it is. We're not going to move it to Black Friday to please TV. We love all college football on our CFP, and I certainly do. So Austria has like a really weird college. And yes, college football in Austria, not the kangaroo, the 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 the, the city of operas and danishes, all right? Uh, Austria, um, they have college football. And uh, apparently they decided to have their championship game in the summertime. So uh, the championship match was between the – and this is, uh, this is a problem. I know it's how you say Vienna in, in – not Welsh in <laughs> in in uh, German or Austrian. So, Uni Win Uni Win Emperors versus the W uh, U Tigers. So apparently, um, the Emperors won ten to nine. So congratulations to our reigning Austria champions. You know this story I loved only because you you all know if you've hung around that I know a lot about Japan and college football. So Japan defeated USA. At the uh, under the U twenty under twenty tackle football world championship up in Edmonton, Canada, um, you know, hey, look at that, go go team Japan. Of course, I happen to have a Japan national helmet. Just I do. Um, it's not I'm not keeping it. I'm actually going to be How did you donating it to the College Football Hall of Fame. And oh, look at that! I even have a third place medal that Japan won in 2016. Where did you get your hands? 2016. I got all this stuff. So all of that said, why did this game happen? It's because all of these countries have ministries of sports that help control budget and all of these things so they can get their better players out there. The United States, we've talked about it. It's the only country in the world that doesn't have because we set the tone for sports. That's all we're actually a uh, it's actually part of our success. We created an incredible university system. But there's no overarching like ministry of sport for all the non, especially the non-revenue sports. So we just have, and, and I'm going to be honest with you all. I had a uh, a coach reach out to me privately who had coached on one of these international teams in the past, and they're coaching right now um, at a major college level. And he even pointed out like these are all the kids that can afford to just go, and you know not everyone can afford to get their passport and go up to Edmonton, Canada to play a game like this, especially when the way our team USA is left to their own druthers. So you get an interesting roster of folks who are obviously not the most talented necessarily and not trying to denigrate them. I mean, they stepped up to represent team America. It meant something to them, but they were completely and hopelessly outgunned. And internationally, it's the sport isn't so bad at other countries that you can just throw up any roster of Americans at them and win. Now, if Georgia went over there or if Ohio State went over there, we would see John Heisman blush. He would be like, whoa, you don't do that to another team. But not when it comes to international football. I mean, some of you might have seen, I think it was Canada, absolutely murdered a guy just to see what it would be like. It was like 110 to zero. Um, my, maybe the other team scored some points, but like, and they're not even playing in their own rules, okay? They're playing American rules football. So, I mean, again, international football is pretty merciless overall. Um, I actually looked at the Japan roster uh, and I recognized a couple of guys only because, as I've said last or now it's two months ago, I saw the six time reigning national champion from Japan come and play the NAI, NAIA team. And some of their freshmen and sophomores were on this Japan team and they were coming from like the best college team in Japan. So you 
it's easy to see how this stuff happens. Um, I wouldn't read too much into it. America's still the best. It wasn't surprising to see Canada came in second. Uh, probably came in first. Uh, I believe they beat Japan. It would have been interesting. My expectations, the surprise was Austria managed to knock off Team USA for the third place. Um, that I'll note there. Um, Mexico didn't participate, and that's where it gets weird. Like sometimes some countries just can't send a team. So if Mexico had gone, I would have expected it to be if, if USA wasn't competing at the right level, Canada, Mexico, Japan, and Mexico and Japan would be in the question on who would have been number two and who would have been number three. That's more realistic when we look at these international tournaments. But if the U.S. ever decides to put a team together, and okay, let me be clear, on the senior level, when you play with whoever, um, America gets its handcuffs because they're not allowed to use anyone who played in pro leagues or entered the draft. They have to be a graduate of a college who is not a professional player. And they're, that's, they're trying to keep it competitive. I mean, that's a, that's a whole other kettle of fish, but yeah, when I saw that U 20, part of the problem is it's literally the kids that can afford to go out there and really want to be part of it. And, you know, credit to them. But unfortunately, then when the other teams are coming to play for keeps, you know, it gets pretty hard. Um, so I'll just set that one aside. I just had a comment on it. I literally just got this the other day. I, I got it because it would be fun to send it to the College Football Hall of Fame as part of this football international package, and I found it. I love it. No one knows how to price anything in some of these countries. In Japan, I got this for like 20 bucks. Trying to buy a pair of game-used, like, oh, wow, game-used jersey. How much is it? $900. I'm like, in the U.S., I would think that's that's insane. Like, And then I found out why. In Japan... The players all buy their own gear. So these are players that are like, do I want to sell my jersey? I mean, yeah, for the right price versus like, you know, overstock at a major university program where it's a little bit more reasonable. But anywho, that, that's either here or there. Um, you know, so one of you guys touched on this. So the NCAA rules have changed. And now, and this went effective immediately, analysts and non-coaches on staffs, because you know some of these coaches have ballooned quite a bit. I mean, Nick Saban is famous for popularizing it because that's obviously where Sark was and Lane Kiffin were and, you know, uh, uh, Butch Jones and some of these other guys. Um, now those guys can coach. They can have direct contact with the players. This kind of came into an interesting note, and some of you may have seen this, because one of those, those kind of transfer moves that you feel kind of bad for the team that got hit by this was uh, Diego Pavia, the, uh, the great quarterback for New Mexico State, went to Vandy, but not only did he go to Vandy, their offensive coordinator, Tim Beck, went to Vandy to be their offensive coordinator, and the head coach, Jerry Kill, who, again, he's had many health issues. I think, again, the stress was maybe getting to him. That's why he left Minnesota. He was a very successful head coach before that. Um, he's also joined Vandy as an offensive analyst, but now he can coach. So you've got Tim Beck, the offensive coordinator, who's a solid. He was also a national championship winner at the D2 level. You've got, I mean, to be fair, this is still Vandy. It feels a little desperate, but I mean, the situation at Vandy has never been particularly easy, but Clark Lee, this is going into uh, to season four. It's pretty, it's, it, we need to see some signs of life. We No one needs Vandy to be like a superb winner, but we need them to be more competitive than they were last season. But this is a promising group by basically bringing all of those guys over from uh, New Mexico State. We'll see where that goes. Another team I just wanted to mention, and they're joining FCS, but Lindenwood is now going to be in year three of their reclassification process so they can play opponents on the FCS and FBS level. In fact, they get their first FBS opponent. Um, they're going to be playing Kansas, and they're going to be playing Kansas. In and For those of you who don't know, Kansas, like Northwestern, they're, and actually, Vandy's kind of in this corner, but they're still playing in Vanderbilt Stadium, but they're only using like half of it because of the construction going on. So they're they're only going to have like 20,000 seats, maybe 23,000 seats this season for Vandy, which is going to be hilarious when like, you know, uh, uh, Texas, I believe, has to go play there. So, but we'll set that aside. Um, Van, pardon me, Northwestern and uh, uh, Kansas are not playing in their home stadium because of major construction. Ryan Field was just totally demolished. Uh, Kansas is splitting their games. Uh, their non-conference games are going to be in, again, the uh, Children's Mercy Park, which is a is MLS stadium. So Lindenwood's first FBS opponent is going to be Kansas in an MLS stadium, but on the Kansas side because they're playing their conference games, of course, in Arrowhead. So it's going to be an interesting uh, two-state solution. Uh, wow, boy, 
that was a whoa, there was a timely uh, reference to international politics. My degree was international relations, so I do Ooh, like that. But uh, I yeah, to... be careful there, man. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> this might have been the last. Talk. This might have been the last talk we ever did. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. So uh, uh, yeah. So anyway, another interesting thing is apparently, according to a recent IRS filing, the NCAA has spent nearly six hundred million dollars on attorney fees on legal expenses since the Alston versus NCA antitrust case began in 2014. And who knows what the other side spent? All this is, is to say, it's great to be a lawyer in billable hours always wins. Um, that's just to, just to hammer that point home. Um, we already touched a little bit on Ollie Gordon. Um, so the other funny side thing is, apparently horns down is not going to be in the uh, co EA, college, EA Sports College football game. Um, they're focusing only on hand signals for your own team for now. And then I love this. Somebody straight up asked Greg Sankey, like, I believe it was at the celebration at Texas um, for their joining the uh, the SEC, if horns down would be a penalty now within the SEC. And again, he's like, I'm not, his answer was, I'm not going to be answering questions about football penalties on July 1st. So there you go. Um I think, oh, and also, you know, of note, Utah has officially named uh, coach in waiting defensive coordinator Morgan Sc uh, Scally. I think it's Scally. Uh, I may have that name a little wrong, and I apologize. But um, that's, again, one of those interesting notes there. I'm not surprised, um, but it's crazy to think how long Kyle Whittingham's been there as head coach. I, I, you always forget that. Actually, speaking of some of these this Japanese material I have, I found, because one of the best postseason all-Star Games from roughly 1977 to 1993 was the Japan Bowl. And it pulled in, I looked at the rosters and I couldn't believe who they were getting to go play a, a game in Yokohama and then later in the Tokyo Dome when it was finished. Like, you'd see the reigning Heisman Trophy winner, like Marcus Allen, Bo Jackson, like uh, Ty Detmer. you like, see those? And then the rosters would just be to the gills. Like, if you actually looked at the roster and look, and they were all, you know, senior graduates, and then look at the end, the uh, the NFL draft that season. You'd see like half the first round played in this game. Um, and then the only reason I mentioned it, I was looking at one of these rosters, and deep in the roster was a BYU player, Kyle Whittingham. So uh, I thought that was kind of funny to see that. John, did you say something? Oh, sorry, sorry, my, my cat's meowing. My bad. Oh. No, no, no worries. Oh. Hey, ski mask. I see your okay. hand up, and then I'm going to slowly wrap this one up. Yeah, you were you were talking about stadiums. Even though I'm I'm hoping and praying that Northwestern allows people to pull up in their boats for games, we need that. But you were talking about stadiums, and it reminded me. Uh, did you see the Texas Tech and what their field and the whole helicopter announcement? And have they they have this huge Adidas and Patrick Mahomes logo on the field now? I didn't see that. That's awesome. I got to look that up. Yeah, it's. They had an announcement, like, they use a helicopter to basically rip off, like, tape you would put on the helmet, but made it look like it was on the field, and, like, the helicopter itself is just a text tech in the middle, Adidas on the left, Patrick Mahomes logo on the right. And I guess these corporate sponsors, are, they're getting in, because it's, it's just as big as the double C's. Yeah, again, for those who may have missed it, now teams are allowed to sell uh, ads on the field. And, again, maybe the smart teams will rotate who they put on the field. And the other joke is maybe some of the uh, more uh, marginal teams will be putting some really curious names on the field, depending on locally who's willing to, to spend. Um, maybe we'll have to do a fundraiser and, and get our name somewhere on a field. I don't know. But <laughs> you know, I think this is a good spot to wrap it up. We've been going for almost an hour and 40 minutes. Wow. Uh, so much to talk about, and it's it's the Fourth of July week, isn't it crazy? Like for for like most websites, including RCFB, I, we always would notice the bottom of traffic is Fourth of July weekend. It's people are busy; they're not really checking um, the website. Although I wonder if with the rise in mobile apps, maybe they will. Um, this is this is old data I'm giving right now, but uh, the excitement thing is after the Fourth of July weekend. We know we're in the rundown. We're, we're running up to the college football season. Media days are going to be starting next week. It's the excitement is going to build. Um, I can't wait. I know y'all can't wait either. So on behalf of all of you, on behalf of all of me, on behalf of all of me, you know, <laughs> thanks for joining us. It is RCFB Talk 199. My name is Bob Akhayuri. If you enjoy my voice and want to hear more, I do the College Football Survivor Show 
for advanced media with CBS Sports Shahan J. Raja. You can get that where you get your podcasts. This will automatically turn into recording when I hit stop. And uh, I'll go ahead and record, take the audio, put it wherever you can get your podcast at RCFB Talk. Um, and yeah, so thanks, you all, for joining us. It was great hearing all of you. Um, it's always great hearing from all of you. And uh, I hope you all have a great 4th of July weekend and do whatever it is that makes you happy. Because enjoy. The summer's here. It's wonderful. Now, I'm going to hang up and listen.